our next uh, yeah, our next speaker is uh, Hundanel. Uh, do you want to put your slides up? Yes. Okay. Uh... All right. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, uh, so I will be talking about my job market paper, which is the gains from market integration, the welfare effect of uh, new rural roads in Ethiopia. Uh, so, you know, countries spend billions of dollars on road infrastructure every year, and these roads play different roles uh, in market integration. Uh, major roads, uh, which includes highways, trunk roads, uh, rail roads, they interconnect different regions of a country or even different countries. And the rural roads connect rural villages to major roads or uh, the, to the urban centers. And several economic studies have estimated the welfare effect of uh, the major roads. Uh, for example, favor for uh, uh, China, uh, highway, uh, elder. And so these trade papers basically uh, focus on these major roads, highways, or uh, uh, railroads that interconnect uh, different regions of a country. And uh, so th the welfare effect of rural roads are, are uh, overlooked, especially in trade literature. There are, there's a small literature in, in the development economics. And uh, um, even those papers provide like very mixed evidences on how uh, the rural roads that connect village to the major roads uh, affect uh, uh, welfare in village economies. Uh, the most notable paper here is Escher and Novosad, uh, which studies the welfare effect of uh, uh, very big uh, rural road expansion in India. And they find that there's basically no effect on consumption uh, or consumption proxies. Uh, but they find that, you know, they facilitate farmers uh, uh, working outside uh, agricultural sector. So uh, there's another paper by Gabriel Silase who finds basically no effect on agricultural productivity. So by, by, uh, by themselves, roads do not affect agricultural productivity, but when they're combined with other uh, uh, infrastructure such as agricultural extension services, they, they tend to be more effective. So what I do in my paper is uh, I study the welfare effect of rural roads using a very rich micro data from Ethiopia and a large scale road expansion project as as a source of variation to uh, uh, trade costs to the farmers. Okay. So one thing, estimating the welfare effect of uh, road infrastructure is complicated in, in, the, in the context of uh, uh, village economies because the first thing is that the production and the consumption decisions of farmers is highly intertwined. In fact, they are mostly made, uh, in most cases they are made jointly. And you know, the roads affect both the, the you know the consumption side and the production side of the farmer's decision. So it's it's not easy to disentangle you know the the, the exact mechanisms through which uh, the welfare is affected. So here I I develop a multi-crop multi-location uh, trade model that captures the key mechanisms through which uh, the roads affect the village uh, welfare. So in the model, it's a very simple model on the consumption side the village decides how much of each crop to consume. And on the production side, they basically decide how to allocate their fixed amount of land across several crops, given the prices of the crops and their village productivity in these crops, okay? So the model gives me uh, some very sharp uh, testable predictions that I take to uh, a panel data on uh, prices, land utilization and productivity at the village level. So to just give you the overview of the results, so the roads, the model implies that the roads increase the relative prices of a village comparative advantage groups, uh, comparative advantage crops. And as a result, the village reallocates more farmland to uh, this, these crops. And uh, you know, that's the, the way the welfare gain happens. More reallocation of farmland towards the crops in which the village is more productive. And uh, the welfare gain from uh, this decrease in trade cost varies across villages, 
depending mm. on uh, is that a question? Okay, depending on the composition of uh, the the uh, the village consumption and production crops. Okay, so here one one example here is I will explain why uh, cash crop village gain more than cereal producing village from uh, a decreasing trade cost. And so my entire exercise is to provide uh, uh, an empirical evidence for this. And uh, I think I have a robust empirical evidence to support these uh, theoretical predictions. Okay. So let me talk about the literature now. So, uh, so my paper is basically related to trade and development literature and the trade literature on the welfare gain from market integration, as I mentioned earlier, uh, these papers basically focus on the welfare gains from you know, roads that interconnect different regions. So they overlook uh, probably, you know, their, their focus is not uh, the, the, the rural roads that connect like the village to the main roads. So <clears throat> in, in the development economics, on the other hand, they focus on the uh, rural roads, but the main shortcoming of these papers is that they do not have like a theoretical structure to guide or to pin down the key mechanisms through which uh, the, the roads or decreasing trade costs affects the village uh, uh, welfare. Okay. So what I do here is I use tools from the trade literature uh, just as a guide to understand how uh, the roads affect village welfare and to provide and I, I give uh, uh, evidences for these uh, mechanisms. So I will talk about the, uh, the road expansion project that I'm using as a source of variation. So it's called uh, the Universal Rural Road Access Program. So this was uh, launched in 2011 for a cost of about $2 billion. And in the policy document, the objective of this program was to integrate rural villages to market centers. Okay, so the roads basically by design, they, they were designed to connect villages to the nearest urban center or to the nearest all-weather road that connects to the urban center and the rest of the, the, the country. So about 60,000, uh, 63,000 kilometers of roads were built uh, in just three or four years matter. And as a result, uh, the total road length in the country doubled. And the rural accessibility index, which is basically the fraction of people living within two kilometers of road, increased from 25% in 2010 to 55% in, in, in 2015. So this is a, a massive uh, scale road expansion, which had a big impact on the, you know, the total volume of road in the country. And the phase two of the project is still going on. So this is what the road expansion looks like. Here, the, you know, the red line shows the pre before this program, the red network that existed. Okay, so it is basically main roads that connect, uh, you know, the, the different regions of the country or the country to the the peripheries or the uh, neighboring countries. So these rural roads basically they were designed to connect villages to the the main roads or to the towns. So as you see, they are very short roads that connect the the rural roads to or to the main uh, road network. Okay, so. This is what they look like, like physically. So these are like minor gra uh, gravel roads, uh, which work like all season. Okay, now I will explain my, my data. So I use several sources of data uh, in my study. So the first one is administrative data on the, the entire road network in the country, which includes uh, information about the quality of each of the roads. Uh, Second is the agricultural production and consumption data. So here I have, uh, uh, I use agricultural sample survey as the, my, the main data. This is the largest annual survey of uh, agriculture with over 40,000 farmers in about uh, 2000 nationally representative villages. So this is a, a panel data at a village level, but in each village, farm, uh, 20 farmers are randomly uh, selected every year. So this includes plot level information on the area of the plot, the crops that cover the plot, the input usage, and the quantities of production on these uh, plots, okay? I also use another uh, source of data for agricultural data, uh, which is a panel data on uh, 4,000 farmers in about 3,000 villages. This, this includes the consumption information of the farmers, disaggregated by crops and also by the sources of the crops, whether the crops are 
produced by the farmers themselves or they, whether they are bought from the market. Okay. So uh, I used the price data, which is a monthly survey of crop prices at different level of market. So I have a agricultural producer price survey. This is a farm gate price, which is price of cro crops at the primary market in the village. And I also have retail prices of the same crops at urban centers, okay, in, up, in over a hundred towns and cities across the country. So I also have other data sets that are uh, the, the product, uh, the gas data, for example, gives me village level productivity of uh, crops. And this data is very important data uh, because it gives uh, predicted productivity of village uh, based on a number of agronomic factors such as you know rainfall, temperature, soil characteristics, and so forth. It, it is not endogenous to like choice of input. Uh, of course, they give like the prediction of the productivity under different scenarios of input usage, but it has nothing to do with the actual uh, uh, productivity uh, on the ground. Okay. So first, I will give uh, some evidence on the effect of the URRAP on market integration. So I use two indicators of market integration here. Uh, the first is uh, rural urban price gap. So as I mentioned earlier, the policy document of the URRAP says the objective is to integrate rural villages to market centers. Okay. So we can test this by just looking at the rural urban price gap. So just to, to before I explain this equation, so Ethiopia is divided into 10 regions. The regions are divided into 60 zones. The zones are divided into about 683 districts and the districts are divided into villages. So I observe prices at village and zone levels. Zones are uh, zone capital cities, okay? So what I do is I look at the price gap. This is zone price of crop K in months M and uh, uh, year T, Z is for zone, okay? And this is the price of the same crop uh, in village within that zone. So how does this village, uh, sorry, uh, rural urban price gap changes for village that get road connection compared to village that do not get road connection? So that's the question, okay? So the result is that the rural urban price gap decreases by 3% overall. But if we look at only uh, perishable crops, vegetables, which, uh, which presumably have higher trade costs than like, like cereals, for example, we see uh, an 8% uh, decrease in, uh, uh, in the rural urban price gap. By the way, this rural urban price gap is about, on average, it's about 44%. So it is, you know, even though the, the distance between the village and the zone capital is just about 30 kilometers or 35 kilometers on average, there is about 44% price gap. So uh, it decreases somehow, uh, especially it decreases for vegetables significantly. Wait, wait, so like, so who don't, uh, about? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yes. So the, so that's saying like the average price gaps 44% and yeah. then the price gaps going down by three percentage points? Yes, three percentage percent. points. Yeah, okay, okay. So yeah. that's, okay. And then yeah, I forgot it's... to say, so what, let me ask, what, like the, I didn't hear the, how well do you think these prices are actually measured? How are the prices measured? How well do you think they are? Oh, okay. So, um, like, is there a recall or is it? No, you know, no, no. So this is, this is the survey. Uh, so what they do is they have enumerators. The, the central statistical authority has enumerators in each location who are, who go to the, the, the shops, they like random sample of shops and they, they actually ask prices. So the, you know, it could be like, uh, you know, if the, the shop owners identify them as, you know, they are non, non buyers, probably they may change the price. I don't know, but uh, normally it is like they are collected uh, by the enumerators, trained enumerators who no, are, who, yeah. Okay. So, so the quality wise, uh, it's actually very good. I, I, I didn't see any kind of, uh, big, you know, uh, uh, problem in the data, especially in the price data, yeah. Go ahead. Who so, I have a question and probably Dan or Mike is gonna have to help me with this. Um, but these roads aren't randomly 
uh, built, right? Is there some issue with selection or one of these things that I wasn't trained very well at Minnesota to, to talk about? Okay, so I will come to that. That's, that's actually the, the most important part of the work, okay? So, okay. yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, second, uh, the second measure of market integration I use is uh, the correlation between local prices and local yield, okay? So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, under autarky, for example, if each village is, an, uh, is by its own and ot under autarky, we will see that there's, there, there should be a strong negative correlation between local price and local yield. Like villages that are more productive in wheat should have lower price of wheat compared to village that has low productivity in, in, in uh, wheat. So what I do is, so if this is productivity, this is price, so how does the negative correlation between productivity and the price change once the village gets connected to road? So that's what this, this uh, regression tries to quantify. So what we find, uh, I find a, a significantly positive uh, alpha three. What, what actually happens is that the correlation between, the negative correlation between this decreases by one third, okay? Uh, all right, so now I will go to my theoretical framework. So this is this is a kind of a toy model, uh, but it, 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 it does, the, I think, the the objective. So, so it's, it builds its own sort of laws, uh, 2018 paper. Uh, so just consider a village economy. There are V villages, each indexed by small V, and there are K crops indexed by small K. And these crops can be potentially produced in the village or they can be imported or they, uh, or, or, and also they can be consumed within the village or exported, okay? So the, you can think of a representative farmer in each village, okay? Uh, okay, so the, uh, the village makes production consumption decision on the consumption side, very simple uh, preference structure, uh, CS preference. This is utility of the village. Q is the quantity of crop K consumed and sigma is the elasticity of substitution between the crops, okay? We can reach this by using, we can make like village specific test or, it, but it doesn't really change anything uh, in what I do. Okay, on the production side, again, I make it very simple. I assume a, ver a constant returns to scale technology with land as the only input. And uh, each village has a fixed amount of land, which is divided into a continuum of uh, plots of size one, because I observe at plot level. So uh, this is very aligned to my empirical uh, exercise as well. So each of the plot has different productivity in the crops, which I denote by Z. So this is the productivity of plot omega in crop K in village V. So the production function given these assumptions is given by this expression where Y is the quantity of crop K uh, produced on plot omega, uh, uh, okay? So, uh, I think that the farmers draw this productivity term independently for plot for each plot crop uh, uh, from a fresher distribution with this uh, cumulative distribution function. And here, you know, a, a here is you know the location parameter, which is simply the unconditional mean of productivity of village V in crop K. And theta is the inverse measure of dispersion. So uh, the, the higher theta the more homogeneous is the, uh, the village land in, in terms of productivity of the crop, okay? Trade, so the, the village trade crop in a perfectly competitive market, uh, paying iceberg trade cost, which is specific to crops. And the reason why we, we need to make it specify, specific to crop is, as I showed earlier, you know, the rural urban price gap changes, decreases by a different amount for, uh, for example, vegetables compared to cereals, okay? So the no arbitrage condition implies that the, you know, price of uh, crops are separated by uh, iceberg third cost across, uh, across villages, okay? So now we solve for the equilibrium land allocation. So each village decides how to allocate just farmland across crops, given the price of the crops and the productivity of their village in the crop. So, you know, it's, since the village objective is to maximize the return from the land, this implies that each plot of land should be allocated to the crop that gives the maximum revenue among all the available options, okay? So this is 
the maximum revenue on plot omega is given by the maximum revenue across all crops on that plot. So this together with the facial distribution implies this land allocation rule. This, so this is the, the, the main result which shows that the fraction of land allocated to crop K is higher, the higher is the price of the crop or the higher is the village productivity in that crop compared to other crops. Okay, so next important result is so I assume that there is a, com a perfectly competitive land rental market, and so uh, in order to drive the equilibrium rental rate, uh, we first have to obtain the conditional distribution of land productivity, the productivity of land conditional on uh, we know that the land is used for crop K. So this is also uh, facet with this uh, expected uh, uh, value. Okay. Now, we use this to, to uh, drive the distribution of the, uh, the optimal revenue. So re optimal revenue is simply the revenue from the crop that maximizes uh, revenue on that plot. And because revenue is simply given by the productivity multiplied by price in my, uh, uh, given my uh, production structure. So the optimal revenue will be the distribution of the optimal revenue will be very similar to this because price is non-stochastic here. So we have revenue, uh, which is also distributed with fresh it with expected value of five. We, we just, you know, because we multiplied by price, this term goes away. Okay, so since land is the only, um, sorry. So yeah, rental rate of the plot is equal to the maximum revenue from the plot because of the competitive land market. Assumption, okay. All right. So, uh, and also, also the measure of welfare in this model is simply because land is the only input. Uh, the real rental rate is our measure of uh, welfare. Okay. So now I'll go to the testable implications. So the first is decreasing trade costs should lead to increases in the relative price of comparative advantage crops. This just follows from the uh, no arbitrary condition and the definition of the, the comparative advantage crops. The more important result is that the decrease in trade costs should lead to reallocation of farmland to a village comparative advantage crops. That means as the as villages get connected to a road, they should allocate more land to their comparative advantage crops. Okay, so this this is this is the uh, the elasticity of the land share of a crop crop K in village V with respect to the productivity of the village. So this is just, this just follows from the, uh, this term, okay? So if we, if we differentiate this with respect to trade costs, uh, so we obtain this result, which shows that, you know, this term is negative because as when the trade cost decreases, the price of comparative advantage crop should increase. So this is negative for comparative advantage crops. So this term will overall become positive. So for a comparative advantage crop, a decrease in trade costs should lead to more farmland reallocation to that crop. And the exact opposite happens for comparative disadvantage crop. The second testable implication is the welfare gain from road depends on, uh, depends on the composition of the village consumption crops relative to the village production crops, okay? So this is the, the, the welfare is given by rate rental rate. Okay, so differentiating this, we obtain this, this equation. So what this is saying is, so uh, village, in, so, uh, so here, eta is the fraction of land allocated to crop K. S is the fraction of consumption expenditure on crop K. So uh, the welfare gain is the, you know, the change in price weighted by this, as, as a weight. So think of a cereal producing uh, uh, village. Cereal constitutes a large fraction of consum consumption expenditure, like 25% of consumption expenditure of farmers. Okay, so for, for a cereal producing village, if crop K is their comparative advantage crop, you know, they have, you know, they, they allocate more land to this crop, but the, because this crop also constitutes a significant fraction of their, their consumption, their, their gain from uh, the, the increase in price of crop K is, is gonna be relatively small compared to 
say if crop K is cash crop and the price of that cash crop increases because the, there is less consumption expenditure on cash crop, the, you know, the village with, with the cash crop uh, as a comparative advantage will gain more, okay? So these things are, uh, they can be directly tested given panel data on land allocation and the, you know, the prices. So can I ask a, one more? So like in a, a lot of these situations, these guys are growing it for their own consumption. And so right. that, is that is that kind of how you want to think about like cereals or rice, for example, in other places that that's, that's the primary own, that's going to be your budget share. And you know what, I, I, I'm kind of wondering if you, you don't have that in here, the choice of own consumption versus market production, market selling it on the market. But is there a way to think about, you know, at least as a reduced form, some of that stuff showing up in here or? Um, so, okay, so this is at a village level. And um, so what I look, what I observe is how much land each village allocates to uh, cash crops and uh, non-cash crops. What I'm trying to do here is that. Um, so the cereals include like a number of crops. So it's, I'm even aggregating those, especially for, for this, uh, uh, to test this, this prediction of the model. But I do have, uh, I have for, uh, for a sample of my farmers, I have uh, how much of their production goes to their, their own consumption and how much it's, it's sold in the market. So uh, I don't have empirical results corresponding to that here, but I, I, uh, I do have that data and also uh, probably I may have in the paper, but yeah. I have looked at like how, mu how much market surplus changes or ma marketed production changes after, after uh, the road connection. Okay. No, that's, that's good. I mean, that's something in the future, like the entry margin might be worth, that kind of margin might be worth thinking about, but I think. All right, okay. May I ask a related question? Okay, go ahead. On um, what do you do about zeros? So the model doesn't predict any zeros for consumption or production. Right, and I would see, assume that there are a lot of zeros in the data. Um, okay, good point. So basically in the model, we can say if the, if, if the village does not produce uh, a crop, you can just uh, assume that the, you know, the average productivity of the village in that crop is zero. The, this A term is zero. So that the fraction of land allocated to that crop is zero in the village. All right, so now I will explain my empirical strategy. Uh, okay, yeah. So as you said earlier, so uh, the, you know, the main challenge in, in identification of the welfare gain from uh, the road expansion is, uh, you know, roads are not randomly uh, uh, placed. And on top of that, even if we assume randomly placed road, uh, there are other issues. So the, the first issue is heterogeneity in treatment intensity. So if you connect a village to a dense network and another to a sparse network where, you know, and connecting a village in, in the middle of nowhere, it, you know, the, the welfare gain is probably not gonna be the same. So we need to take that into account. Another issue is the spillover effect. So when you connect a village, it's not only the village that is directly connected that, that gains from the road. Neighboring village, even though they are not directly connected, they may also gain because you know they indirectly they become closer to road, right? So there is a spillover effect, so that you know we cannot just do difference in difference uh, because you know the we don't have a good control group. So those villages that are not directly connected are not a good control group. So these two issues can be uh, addressed by using the market access measure that takes into account the entire road. Uh, uh, network and also the, the distribution of population across the entire village. So I do that. So instead of binary treatment dummy, I, I use market access that is uh, uh, calculated from, you know, general equilibrium trade models. Okay. So here, so this is the market access of origin village or in, uh, in time T is, this is uh, the cost of transporting one ton of weight from origin village or to destination D. In, in year T. So this is the only parameter that uh, uh, value that changes because of the road. 
Okay, so population is the same. I use the pre uh, pre road program population because it could be endogenous to uh, the road by itself. So this addresses the you know the heterogeneity in treatment intensity to some extent and also the spillover effect uh, here. Sorry, I I don't. I, oh, you're about to talk about selection bias. Selection bias. Okay, so. The main issue is selection bias. So because you know officials might prioritize you know village probably based on their potential gain. You know it's just, it makes sense to connect the village which we which may gain more than the others, right? So to address this, I use uh, IV estimation. Uh, so what I do is I first obtain a predicted road, uh, road network based on land gradient, the slope of land, and location of rivers and lakes in the country. So what I do is I have regional budget of roads that was set in, 2000, in 2010 from the very beginning. So, so you know, each region planned to construct this amount of roads from the very beginning in that five year of window. So what I do is given that regional budget const, uh, constraint, I connect each village in the, uh, in the region to the pre-existing road network starting from the village that are very close to the, the road network until my regional budget constraint is exhausted, okay? So that gives me a predicted red network that is based on just cost factor, not, it doesn't take into account settlement of population or any, you know, potential gain calculation or something like that. So it's cost, the road network implied by the cost consideration, okay? So given this road network, I calculate my market access measure that looks like, like this, okay? But based on the predicted road network. So I use that predicted market assess as an IV for my actual market assess, okay? So first I will talk about the result on welfare. So the measure of welfare is real agricultural income here. So this is uh, uh, log real agricultural income, which is revenue, uh, revenue from crop production divided by uh, price index and the size of the, the cultivated land in the village, okay? Because this changes every year in my data. So this is like nominal income from all crops divided by the price index that I calculate. This is a CES from the CES uh, preference. And this is the, the size of land cal uh, cultivated in the village. So X includes a vector of control variables such as rainfall. And Sigma here is, uh, I will talk about it if I have time later. Uh, so I estimate sigma of 1.3 from uh, uh, the uh, from my data. Okay. So I also run an alternative specification that addresses the endogeneity and also the uh, other concerns of identification using you know replacing this term by the market assets here. Okay. So I have village fixed effect and year fixed effect. So this is the results following the binary treatment. So we see that there is 16.9% increase in real income following uh, the connection, road connection. And the, the, the market assess approach gives us, so looking at the IV result, which is uh, the, the most preferred one, it's, it shows about you know, the elasticity of real revenue to market assess is about 0.31. And this translates into like for a village with average change in market assets, this is about 15% increase in real agricultural income. Okay. So the next result is to look at, so we, we say, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cereal and non-cereal producing village might gain differently. So uh, as you see here, Cereal producing village gain significantly less compared to uh, non cereal uh, producing village. And you see the similar kind of uh, result using the market assess approach, but the, you know, the quantity is tiny here. Okay. So the cereal share is a standardized measure of, uh, so I have a standardized, so it's, this is one standard deviation higher uh, cereal share compared to the mean, the mean village. Okay, so now I will talk about the mechanisms. So, you know, our toy model implies that, you know, the main mechanisms through which you know, this decrease in trade costs should affect welfare in our simplified version is that uh, the road connection should increase the relative price of comparative advantage crops 
And second, the village should reallocate more land to these crops so that you know the, this will translate into higher nominal income in uh, what, we ha- what we have here, uh, okay, on the numerator. And of course, the effect of the, uh, the decrease in trade cost on village price index is ambiguous be- depending on you know, their, the composition of their production and uh, uh, consumption. So the main challenge here is to, we have to define what the village comparative advantage crop is. So for that, I have measure of yield of uh, village level yield of crops. So what I do is first I calculate the village yield relative to national average for each crop. So this is average productivity of crop K nationally, and this is the productivity of crop K in village V. So this is the village relative productivity compared to the national average. Next, within each village, I rank crops based on their relative yield. Okay, then I define crops in the top twenty percent as the, the, the baseline comparative advantage crops for the village. And of course, I relax this threshold to top thirty percent or forty percent. And also, I, I, I use just the rank, uh, sorry, the, the relative average as a measure of comparative advantage. And uh, uh, so that is how we define the, the comparative advantage. Okay, so. So first I show the the effect on prices of comparative advantage crops. So this is log price of crop K in village V. So this is monthly price. So I didn't aggregate at year level because, you know, seasonal fluctuation is probably important. So, yeah. So this is log price at village V for crop K, the market access of the village. So I, I interact that with the comparative advantage dummy. So whether crop K is the village comparative advantage crop. So I have a crop fixed effect, month year fixed effect, and a village fixed effect. Okay. So this is the result. So uh, it's the OLF result. And as you see that, you know, the price of uh, the comparative advantage crops increase uh, relative to, you know, the uh, other crops. Uh, following an increase in market, uh, 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 increase in market access or road connection. Okay, so whenever you know, this is my preferred. Like I consider like top twenty percent crops like as a comparative advantage crops. Uh, so the price of comparative advantage crops increases by three point six percent. Okay. So next is. To look at the effect of the, the, the roads on reallocation of farmland to comparative advantage crops. So again, so we have market access and ma- uh, comparative advantage demi and interaction of the two. So the result is very similar to the previous one. So because here, you know, the, our dependent variable is the, fa- the, the fraction of land allocated to crop. Uh, so this, you know, the interpretation is like uh, this translates into about 4% increase in the fraction of land allocated to comparative advantage crop. Okay, so this is overall, it's between three and 4% increase in the fraction of land allocated to comparative advantage crop uh, following the road expansion. Could I, could I have a quick um, clarifying yes. question? The way you construct your comparative advantage, um, how do I separate that from like, uh, uh, for instance, a scale economy type of story? like? Like you know, you you just had, uh, you know, you just have something that you you have a scale economy rather than compare advantage. It seems like that by the bio definition, it's hard to tell apart these two uh, type of stories. So this is productivity. So this is quantity of crop produced per hectare. So the the, the ether, okay. Yeah, but so but for- it's it's measure of productivity. You know, it's kind of like you can have fixed costs involved in there. You know, I, I need to buy a certain amount of fertilizer. You know, for um, for like you know, if I have a very small acre versus a very large acre, you know, maybe there's something just fixed. Um, All right, okay, so uh, I see. Okay, so alternatively, what I do is I have gas data that that predicts productivity of each village. Uh, in uh, in each crop, based on the temperature of that location, the soil characteristics of the location, and a number of agronomic uh, uh, characteristics. Okay, so the, as a robustness to like the measured productivity, I use that one. So that one is just 
predicted based on satellite data on temperature, rainfall, uh, uh, soil characteristics, and and under different input usage uh, assumptions. Okay, so I use that, and that is robust to like what you, what you have said, like the scale issue where you know you, you when you use a small land, probably your productivity might be high. So that is, uh, yeah, that solves that problem. So I have uh, my results are robust to that that productivity measure as well. Does that answer your question, Pedro? Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah, go ahead. All right. So, yeah. So this is the result for land reallocation, which is three to four percent increase in the fraction of farmland allocated to comparative advantage crops. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. Just just a follow up. Um, I have no idea, like the products that they, these guys produce, but is there any time to build in the sense that, like, an orchard takes a while to to shift and so you see like different elasticities oh, okay. at different horizons. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I forgot to mention it, but so here what I do, so all, all my previous results so far, they are based on 25 major crops, crops that are relatively widely produced and non-tree crops. Because non-tree crops probably takes time to adjust, for example, coffee, you know, it takes about five years to, to, to adjust the, the production of coffee or other tree crops. Basically. So I, I exclude those in my basic uh, analysis, but including them doesn't change actually the result that much. So I have it in the robustness exercise. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So yeah. So the final result here is to see the effect on uh, village price index. So what happens here is when we use the binary treatment, we see like the village price index increases, but basically, you know, in the, the this has the preferred uh, estimations, we don't see any change in the village price index uh, due to road uh, uh, connection. So this is because, you know, prices of crops change depending on whether the crops are comparative advantage crops or disadvantage crops. So they tend to cancel out each other. So we don't have a significant effect on uh, price index here. Okay, so next I, I look at how, you know, vi, you know, different villages gain in terms of uh, welfare, you know, so one argument is that, you know, do we have to connect the villages that are very close to towns and ignore others which have probably high economic potential or, yeah. So this, this basically tries to answer what happens, how much of the welfare, how much that the welfare gain vary across villages based on their remoteness, okay? And uh, so as a measure of remoteness, uh, I use distance to towns, the nearest towns, which, which with over 20,000 population, distance to the pre, uh, the trunk roads, and distance to the pre-existing URR AP roads, that means the pre-existing road network. And it appears that villages that are distant from, uh, you know, remote villages tend to gain less than uh, the non-remote villages in terms of welfare. And <coughs> here, you know, it's, it could be that, you know, even though the roads tend to decrease trade costs, uh, probably the trade cost does not decrease enough to induce uh, a trade of, you know, the, the remote villages with, with, uh, with, uh, with the urban centers. Probably. Okay. So, as a robustness exercise, I, I actually conduct a number of robustness tests. So the first is an alternative way of addressing the identification concern here. So instead of using the IV, what would happen uh, if we use say matching based difference in difference? So by that, I mean, I first obtain a matched sample of treated and untreated village, village that get connection and not get connection based on the village characteristics before the, the program was launched, such as population density, land gradient, rainfall, distance to road, and uh, other factors. So once I obtain a much sample of treated and untreated villages, I conduct just the difference in difference estimation strategy using the, the, the market assess approach or the, just the binary treatment, okay? So the results here are very similar to what we, we saw. Uh, so this is the what the matching looks like. So you know, except for few untreated villages, 
you know, there's this large area of concert. <laughs> uh, so that, that showed the quality of the match. And the welfare gain um, is about 12.5% here. And uh, so this translates to about uh, 9%. So it's, it's relatively smaller and also because probably we lose some power also. Um, and, you know, the, the um, yeah, the price of comparative advantage curves, they increase by almost the same magnitude as the, 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 the main specification, okay? All right. Uh, and also, okay, yeah. So yeah, this one also increases, this is the, the the allocation of farmland towards comparative advantage crops. This is also almost the same magnitude as the, the main specification. Okay, so another uh, robustness exercise I do is I include all the 45 crops for which I have price and production data. So this, all the previous results were based on the 25 major crops, widely produced crops and non tree crops. And including all the crops, doesn't change any of the results. And another is uh, related to your previous question, I use instead of the, the measure of productivity that is provided by the, the statistical authority, I use the gaze data on productivity that is predicted based on just agronomic factors. And the result is quite similar to the, uh, the, the main result, okay? Okay, so just to conclude, so what I do in this paper is I study how Large scale uh, road construction affects welfare in uh, village economies. I first provide evidence that the roads improved uh, market integration and estimate an average welfare gain of 15% for, for a village that, that gets an average level of increase in market assets. And I uh, also provide uh, a robust empirical evidence on the mechanisms through which uh, the roads affect welfare. Basically, I show that the, roads, the road connection leads to increases in relative price of locally produced or local comparative advantage crops. And that induces more farmland reallocation to these crops and translates into more uh, gain in terms of real uh, revenue from crops. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. I think I, yeah. Okay, so we'll open the, uh, uh, the, the line for questions or comments. Could I, could I have a, maybe this is a too much a general question, but you know, there, 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 there has been a now a very long line of literature thinking about intermediation in the agriculture market in these countries. Like, you know, they're, they're work by like Jonathan's colleague, for instance, Shumitra about India and, and uh, uh, Lauren uh, Burquist in Kenya, you know, they all basically thinking about just, you know, you've you been modeling these agriculture being like almost frictionless. Um, and the only thing matters is the, is the trade cost, but effectively there's a kind of like quite strong market power by these intermediaries uh, in, in these countries. You know, you are the one on the ground, so you, you possibly know the Ethiopian market better, but just wonder, you know, what's your view of like what, how, how the intermediary has been playing a role here in terms of these agricultural goods um, trade. And effectively, I think it's also interesting that you find there's a price increase uh, in terms of these compared advantage, uh, what do you call compared advantage crops, um, which which might actually shed a light on also thinking about you know the market power of the of the intermediation there. Right. Okay. So um, one thing that is yeah. So who gains from? So there is some sort of gain in, in terms of like reallocation of farmland to the the, the, the most productive crops, but what happens? Like from the you know the anecdotes is that now because you know there are roads that go to like the village centers, the intermediaries now can operate like very efficiently. So it means like they have they can now just drive into the village. Before they couldn't do that because these villages are not accessible by by vehicle. So uh, so one anecdotal uh, information is that you know farmers see like you know, many intermediaries coming to their village, sort of. So it, it shows that I think the farmers probably gain, like it is not like uh, the intermediaries would capture all, all, all of the reasons. It's the farmers gain because the, you know, the, the opening of the infrastructure has led to more 
uh, grain traders who go like deep into the village and uh, get the village to the, the urban centers and get some gain. Before there were, you know, intermediaries, but not uh, probably as many because now it makes uh, entry easier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's what I was kind of like uh, alluding to. It's like you know, there's a reduction of monopoly power. That's you know, then you know, maybe what you observe if you are documenting what you call the price is the bargaining outcome. Then you know, it's really just thinking about the because of this reduction of monopoly power, the farmers gaining more. You know, I just don't know whether the price you describe in your data is really the price that farmers been obtaining, or you know, there's some other prices. So it, it doesn't matter for your story. I guess. Well, so okay, so these prices are so the prices at the farmers level. The price in my data are the price at the farmers level. But as you said. Uh, so this 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 comes back to like what's the mechanism now? Is it like because of the road now there are more uh, intermediaries so that they are competing with each other and offering better price? Or yeah, th that could be part of the story, as, as you said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, it's good to probably if there is a way to quantify that. Yeah, I'll think about it. So I was going to ask, uh, so all your IVs, your IV estimates are larger than your OLS estimates. Right. Yeah. So how do we think about like what that means? Uh, so actually, so if you take, uh, for example, let's go to the, the result for the uh, welfare. Okay. So this is, yeah. So this point three, so, so for a village with, so this is elasticity, right? So to see how much the welfare uh, really income changes for a village with average level of market access, you have to multiply this by the average level of market access. If you do that, you get 0 0.5, 0 0.15, which is, which is close to this. So it is not really, you know, this is a demi variable. This is, this is a continuous variable. I see. Yeah, so they are, they are not very way off. This is 0.15, this is, so then in, like in response to Kim's question, like the selection issue doesn't seem large. The, the selection issue doesn't seem large, but yeah. it's not just the selection issue because we also have a spillover and this, you know, this, this, this issues also. Sure. So, and they, they tend to operate uh, in, in, in the, uh, they're not all, always in the, in the same direction. The selection probably may lead to overestimation, right? And spillover effects leads to uh, underestimation. So they tend to kind of cancel out each other. So it's, uh, it's not clear whether they have to be, the OLS have to be larger than the, the IV. I, I guess the way you could address is really depend on policy objective. You know, you could think about this being upward bias, but on the other hand, you know, if the, if the purpose of building the world is to kind of poverty elevation, you know, it can have it negatively correlated. So, you know, I don't think you do have to defend yourself to say it have to definitely go up or go down, really come back to the backward kind of the, the incentive why you were building the world in the first place. Well, that, that's what I, exactly what I'm asking is, is like, what, where is, is this revealing the, the road builders incentives about where they want to place it? And, yeah. and yeah. The, like, I, and it could go different ways. Like, and I'm, it, that's what I, it sounds like, I think your answer that this stuff kind of is just canceling out is, I mean, that's like, like Alwyn Young has these papers and kind of talks about some of this issue about, you know, this is just some divine coincidence. This stuff cancels out and it's A-OK. -okay. And that's kind of looks like what you, that sounds good too, so. Can I ask about the magnitudes of, of the results? Like um, you had this big welfare number at, at the very end and you started out at the very beginning with like a, a big number for the cost of building the roads. Is, is there any way of converting that into like a, a return? Okay, yeah, that's actually, that's a good question. So yeah, I will, I will, I will try to have that like the back of envelope uh, calculation. So this welfare effect, by the way, is, is not really big when compared to like, uh, you know, at this, uh, the country has been growing like very fast. So there's a, a on average of 10% growth at that at that time of, uh, you know, during this period. So it's like 15% increase in real income over five years. It's not a big, it's, it's like, it's not like very big as, as it seems. Uh, yeah, I mean, but it's permanent, right? Um, and, and so it, uh, 
And yeah, I, I would just, it would be, it'd be useful to sort of compare the numbers and just sort of see like what kind of, you know, just so we can kind of decide on how many more roads to build or not. Um, so. Good point, okay. It's, it's kind of like the calculation in the previous paper, right? Like um, when you net out the trade costs, um, the, the gains aren't so big. Um, and so here, you know, you, you kind of want to see how, how much was given up to, to get that extra income, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, yeah. Yes, I, actually it's the only information required here is uh, uh, the cost per kilometer of the roads. Once that is obtained, I think, yeah. I mean, you could do it by village by village, or you know, if you wanted to. But anyhow, thanks. All right. Any other question or suggestion? So I, I actually had a thought, which was um, when you first started showing the results on the prices, it, it seemed much more about um, you know you showed differences in by the perishability of the goods, um, cereals versus you know fruits. Um, I, I wonder um, to what extent, like this is really about the roads lowering the time to get from one place to the other versus the distance. Um, so, so the distance and, was, and that's going to be. Uh, okay, uh, so the distance was the same, right? This is just the roads. When the roads come, it's like it's easier to transport quick or to it's easier to move them quickly. So it's basically vehicles. Before they were there were no vehicles, so these are not accessible by vehicles. Now, when they become accessible, what benefits more is like, I don't, I, I don't have it uh, here in, in terms of, uh, but for example, the same happens, for example, for uh, milk. So because I'm focusing here on, on crops. So the, the perishable ones, they, they see like a decrease, mass decrease in the rural urban price gap. So pro, that is probably- Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I was just thinking that some some places were probably harder to get to the <laughs> urban centers than than bef before, and the 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 reduction in distance, the, the reduction in time to get to the urban centers was very different, and so it's kind of like a, a bigger shock for some places versus other places, and would would end up having like a different impact on on the crop mix um, if you had some measure of the kind of how, how easy it was to get to the urban centers before versus after. Uh, okay. Other than the road, okay. Pro, I will. I will think about that. Okay. I think you follow Sotelo and assuming people stay in their village, it doesn't play a big role since they're not an input into production. But they um, are consumers, I guess. So they they determine demand. You didn't say anything about population relocation. And I just wondered, is it fair to say that people are pretty much staying in their villages or has there been much relocation? Yeah, so he, yeah, so I'm, I'm assuming that people <laughs> are staying in uh, at their village. And it, it probably reflects the, the reality also. Pro, uh, what could happen is they, the road may help them to like temporarily go out to the towns and work and go back home, like, mm -hmm. uh, like temporal or like daily migration. But relocation is probably unlikely for, for the farmers because they're pretty much their livelihood is tied to the, their land. And uh, yeah. Did that answer your question? Sorry. Hello. Okay. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, Roman or George.